Hi, I'm Andy, and this is a video about using the Go Dot uh, game engine, uh, specifically how to um, drag and drop shapes that are also involved in physics. So they can normally they bounce off each other and fall under gravity, um, uh, but I've found a way to make them drag and drop. So it's a few things I learned while I was trying to make this work. I'm pretty new to Go Dot. Um, please make comments if um, I've done things. I'm done things the best way. Um, stuff like that. Um, uh, still learning. Um, I think this video will probably uh, help you with two things. So number one, I found it quite hard to find out how to do any kind of drag and drop with objects apart from uh, like UI objects in Godot. I'm sure someone's done a video about it or written it up somewhere, but I couldn't find it. So I found a way of making dragging and drop just ordinary uh, objects and shapes work. And secondly, um, there's some wrinkles and tricky bits around that when the things that you're dragging and dropping normally drop under gravity, bounce off each other, stuff like that. Um, so they'll be working in the game world, um, which I built up in the previous video, which is called Godot, uh, 2D shapes bouncing off each other. Um, so uh, have a look at that video if you want to see exactly what I'm working with, but hopefully the um, ideas I'm working on in this video will make sense on their own. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to listen for events that happen in the whole of the game world. Um, that'll be mouse movement and mouse click events, and then we're going to, based on where you clicked and where you're dragging, we're going to change the position and velocity and things of some of the objects. So let's start off by just showing you how the world works at the moment. So this little game we've written, it's got a square and a triangle and a bit of floor. A uh, square can and triangle can bounce off each other and move around and the floor just stays where it is because it's a static body. The square and the triangle are rigid bodies. Um, but yeah, gravity affects them, they bump into each other. But we also want to be able to drag and drop them. So what we're going to do is we're going to... Um, yeah, well let's start off by listening for mouse events on the world. So we've got this... Um, so I tried to listen to mouse events on individual objects. I wondered whether you, you drag and drop an object because it, it saw that there was a mouse click event happening on it specifically. Now one of the wrinkles that happens with these objects that are in inside the physics simulation is that Godot is quite keen to send them to sleep. When it thinks that they're not moving at the moment, they've got no forces uh, making them accelerate, it will send them to sleep, which is really good because it means that you don't run out of CPU for the interesting bits of your game. Um, but it's really bad when you're trying to listen to input and suddenly the object's asleep and doesn't seem to get any input anymore. Um, or, or no processing happens for it. So um, the, the way I found to make this work was to um, listen for those mouse events in the world and then um, figure out what object you're clicking on later. So, um, if you've been following my videos, this is the first time we're going to write any actual code. Uh, so that's exciting, isn't it? Um, so I'm going to click on the world node, and I'm looking down in this inspector, and you can see there's a thing here that says script. If I choose the drop down, I'm going to say new script. We're going to make a script, as in a bit of code, uh, that goes with this world. Click on that. I'm okay with all this. It's making a, um, a script called world.gd, which seems fine to me. And here is our code editing window, uh, which is a bit small, but that will restrict me, hopefully, to um, not doing things that are too difficult or crazy. Um, so this is the bit of code that goes along with that world node um, that we saw. And uh, always at the top of these scripts, um, you'll see it says something like extends node. So this is like... Uh, it might be familiar if you've done object-oriented programming, although it looks a bit different from how it looks in some other languages. But basically this is saying um, the, the type of object that we're working with is a node, and we're customizing the behavior of this node object. So you can think of this as meaning we're actually inside a class definition, um, if you're used to object-oriented programming, uh, and we're overriding methods of that object. For example, there's a um, a function down here called ready, that's like a, um, a the, the node, uh, normal node objects have a ready function which um, doesn't do anything. If we want to make something special happen when this node first gets created, we could put some code in the ready function. However, we don't need any of that stuff, so we can get rid of everything that it's pasted into here for us. We'll just try out making this big and see if, yeah, it looks a bit better, a bit clearer. Um, 
and what we're going to do is I'm going to try and build this up gradually. So first of all, we'll just figure out how to listen for uh, input uh, and uh, see what happens when events happen uh, to this world. So uh, the way we're going to do that is we're going to make a function. So this programming language is a bit like Python. Uh, a lot of the kind of syntax and stuff is pretty familiar if you've done any Python. Um, if you haven't done any Python, don't worry, because the reason why they've made it like Python is because Python is reasonably easy to understand. So for me, because Python was quite familiar already, the hard bits about Godot are not understanding the syntax, um, but figuring out what types of objects exist and what types of events happen and things like that. So the 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 event or the interesting bit of code that, that we can write for listening to mouse events, the best way, I tried a few different ways of uh, making that happen. Uh, the best way that I found, um, that well, the way that worked for me was if we make a function inside this world object um, which takes in an event argument, and if we call it underscore input, this is a special name which means it will get called when any kind of input stuff happens to world. And it, this is a function definition, so we're making a function and we're passing in, it's, we're getting passed into that, this thing called event, and that's going to tell us what happened. So something happened because input got called, and then what happened um, is going to be told to us by this event. So let's start off. Well, Go dot has this quite useful thing that just like in Python, you can say uh, print, and it will print out some stuff um, somewhere where you can see it. So while your program is running, you can have a look at what's what happened. Um, you, you can print stuff out and just. Um, Check, check what happens. So what we'll do is we'll run the program and see what gets printed out. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah. So, um, yeah, as I said, this is like Python code. So um, although in Python you would say def instead of func here, but it means exactly the same thing as in Python. But yeah, the way you define a function is you say func, you, you say its name, you say what things are going to get passed into it, what arguments. You put a colon on the end, and then your next line, anything inside that function, has to be indented by pressing tab. So you don't use curly brackets, you use indenting. And then you'll see later when we write more code, um, if you write an if or something like that, then the stuff that happens inside that if or that loop uh, has to be indented again. Um, and if you haven't done that before, um, it, it can take some getting used to, but it does mean that your code tends to be quite clearly laid out. You can see what's going on. It has advantages and disadvantages. So we'll save the scene. Um, we'll run the program and hopefully whenever any inputs happen some stuff will get printed out. So I'm going to move the mouse around, mouse around so stuff happens and we'll go back to our um, program and I'll just make sure that, that um, full screen button is visible and if I move myself out of the way for a sec we can see in this output window while the game was running we saw a whole load of stuff get printed out. So that means that that input function did get called, and what it printed out was just this input event mouse motion because I moved my mouse. So that tells me that this code is working. And it's printing out these events as they happen. So um, let's go into a bit more detail and let's distinguish between some different types of event and print different things. So I'm going to put an if in here, I'm going to say if the event is an input event mouse button and I'm going to print out um, button and I'm going to say elif event is input event mouse motion I'm going to print motion so Let's have a quick look at that. So this event tells us about um, what happened. Uh, and then this is the way of asking, well, what type of thing happened? Um, by asking, is event uh, an input event mouse button? So this is keyword is ask, allowing us to say, tell me what type of thing event is. Is it the type of thing that I'm calling input event mouse button? Or is it not I'm calling? That's what Godot calls it. Um, so um, we're going to get different types of event. Um, based on whether you clicked something or you moved, or possibly you'd plenty of other things as well, but we're not interested in the other things. So and I'm printing out different things um, depending on what happens. So let's run the game again, um, and I'll see if I can resize the window so that we can see 
what it's printing out. No, I can't. So anyway, let me move the mouse around and click a bit. Close it. And you should see some stuff got printed out. So a lot of mouse motion events happening. Um, and from time to time there are hopefully will be some button events. Although I'm not currently seeing them. I wonder what I've done wrong. Maybe I need to say that this node is interested in mouse events. I'm not sure. I'm just checking my reference project um, that I'm copying from that you can't see. Don't see anything special there. So let's just um, confirm that we get the mouse button clicks. Maybe I missed them, maybe they got lost. So we'll save that code. Um, I've just commented out, so putting a hash at the beginning means just make that line not run. You see it goes gray. So that's just like in Python, you comment lines out. So now I'm saying I'm only interested in um, if the event is a mouse button event. We'll try again. I'll see if when I click, interesting things happen. I clicked a few times. Ah, oh, we are seeing button game. Um, printed. So I think I must have just um, missed that or done it wrong with the previous one. So for now, we're not going to be. In, we're not going to. We're not interested in mouse motion events. We will be in a minute, but we'll leave that commented out for now because I want to first start off by distinguishing between uh, when you when the mouse button went down because you started dragging, and when the mouse button came up again. Um, so the way we can ask about that with this event object is we can say if event dot is pressed. And we're going to print out, say, click. And the, I happen to know, having tried this out, that um, uh, that the only two options are either this was a click or it was an unclick, as in the, the well, a mouse up event. So um, let's try that out. So I'm going to click and then unclick, click and then unclick, click and then unclick. And we should see printed out in our output window different events for those two different things that happened. And you have to believe me, because my window's filling this whole screen because I've made it quite small. You can't see that happening live, but believe me, um, when you when I click down, that's when it printed click, and when it came up again, that's when it printed unclick. So now we've got the ability to distinguish. Um, to, to find out um, what the user is doing with their mouse. So what I'm going to start off with is I'm just going to um, try moving just one object, just the square, um, based on the movement of your mouse and then later we'll figure out which one you actually clicked on and move the right one. But for now we'll just move the square itself. So the way we can do that um, yeah, well, what we'll do is we'll just figure out, am I, um, we need to remember somewhere, um, am I currently dragging the object? Because when we get a mouse motion event, we want to move the object, but only if the mouse button is currently down. So we're going to make a variable. So the way you make a variable in GD script, which is the go.script language, um, is you say var and then you give it a name and I'm going to call it dragging. I'm going to start off with it set to false, but that should be with a small f. Notice if you're used to Python, that looks different because in Python it's a big f. In GD script it's a small f. So I'm going to set dragging to false to say no, we're not currently dragging anything yet. And then when when the mouse button goes down, we're going to say right, yep, we have started dragging, so we're going to change the value of dragging to be true. And when the mouse button comes up again, we're going to set it back to false. So that just keeps track of am I dragging now or am I not dragging now. And I'm going to get back to noticing mouse movement events. And if we are dragging at this moment, I'm going to move um, the square um, however much we dragged. So the way I'm going to do that is first of all, I'm going to get hold of the square. So I'm going to say, um, I'm going to make a new variable here called shape. And I'm going to get hold of the actual square object 
in our world. So you can see there's an object here called square and when I click that we switch back to the 2D mode so that's the square there. It's called square and that's how, that's why because its name is square I, I can say get not get but get node apologies. So when I say get node square it goes and looks through all of these nodes which is what they're called and it finds the one that's called square uh, and puts the answer into this variable shape and then what I want to do is I want to tell that shape to move. So let's start off by doing it the wrong way just so that I can keep all the code on this one page and you can see how much pain I've gone through just for you um, to figure out what the right way is. Um, yeah, not that. So what the, the first way I tried to do this was just this. Um, Get relative. So, I'm going to explain what I'm doing here in a second. Relative. So, I just saved for then. By the way, I press Control S. So, what we're saying is, if the if the person playing the game moved their mouse, I'm just spreading things out a bit. If the person playing the game moved their mouse, that's what this bit means. Then get hold of the square and store it in a variable called shape, and then call this function for shape called translate. Now translate means move that object and how much to move it we're actually getting the answer for how much to move it out of the event object because the event has this method called get relative which basically means because this is a mouse motion event it has this method get relative which means tell me how far you moved it um, and we're passing that into translate to say move the shape this far so we're basically saying However far you move the mouse, move the shape that much. Um, there's a subtlety going on here, which is that um, this movement that we're getting back is obviously um, potentially movement upwards and sideways, or you know, two directions at a time. So what get relative returns is not just a number for how much you've moved, um, but a vector two, which is basically how much you moved x and how much you moved y. Um, and it just so happens that translate takes in a vector 2 as its argument, so it just works to pass them between. Um, so remember I told you this was the wrong way to do it, so uh, this is going to sort of work. So let's try that out and see how it sort of works, hopefully. So here are the things they're moving around. When I... Oh, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> so I forgot to look at whether we we're dragging or not. So. Um, the square moves all the time, so that's not going to demonstrate what's wrong. Um, so let's try and do a bit better. So what we should actually be saying is if we're currently dragging, because the we, we tracked whether we were dragging in the previous bit of code, if we're currently dragging around, then get hold of the shape and move it. So let's try that again. So here they come, and they're fine. And then if I click and drag, I can move the square and it works so things are looking good but you may have noticed well a number of things number one I don't have to click on the square to drag it but we'll fix that later but number two it doesn't fall down anymore so um, why not well the reason is that I, I did it the wrong way like I warned you so basically if there is an object that is participating in the physics as in the gravity and bumping into things in Godot you shouldn't be calling methods like translate or set position on it. Um, that that really messes up the physics engine. Uh, I think the way in which it mess it gets messed up here is actually slightly different, which is just that um, uh, the the shape has gone to sleep. You know, I mentioned that earlier. Um, if uh, if if the physics engine has decided that this shape isn't currently doing anything interesting, it will send it to sleep, which means um, it doesn't do any calculations for it at all. So at that point, um, even though it, we dragged it to a place where nothing is holding it up anymore, um, the Godot engine isn't checking whether it should be falling, so it doesn't fall. We can probably um, demonstrate how this works slightly differently. If I if I drag it while it's still falling, so it hasn't fallen asleep yet, it may keep falling. Let's try it. That didn't work at all. Let me try again. 
Yeah, no, it doesn't want to move. Yes, okay, so this this, this demonstrates perfectly. So I'm calling translate on this object, but actually the physics engine owns this object and doesn't want you to start messing about with it, and it's actually just not working at all um, when we're doing it. So we actually have to do it a different way. And the way we do it is we insert our code into the middle of where the physics code is running instead of trying to just completely override it like we're doing by calling translate. So the way we do that is we actually need some code to be linked with the square. So previously, all this code we've written so far is linked with the world, not linked with the square. But what, if we're going to override the way square does its physics calculations, we need to write a script that's linked with the square itself. So if we click on the square and look in the inspector and scroll all the way down to the bottom, um, it also has a script thing. So we're going to say new script, just like we did with the world, but now we're making one that goes with the square. But I know that this script isn't only going to be for the square. It's going to be for all of my shapes. So I'm going to call it shape.gd. You can call it whatever you like. So now we've, we've created this script. Um, and if we look again in the in the inspector for the square, we can see the script now says shape.gd. So we've successfully linked um, this square with the script, even though they've got different names. And again, it's got a load of stuff in that we don't really need. Um, we leave in this thing that says it extends rigid body 2D. That's essentially saying all this code that we're writing here is inside a rigid body 2D, because square is a rigid body 2D. We can get rid of all of this. And the way that you insert your own code into the physics that's going on is you make a function, you call it integrate forces. And again, if I've done this wrong or not the best way, please write comments, because this is what I've figured out um, in my sort of early steps with the go.engine. So what this does is, um, every time it calculates um, the physics for this object, it calls this method, if you've made it, and it passes you in some state. And you can actually, um, that's where you can change stuff about this shape, if you want to. Uh, and that's what we're going to do. So what we're going to do is, um, we're going to move it by a certain amount, because that's what the, um, uh, that's what we wanted to do before. We called this transform method and that was the wrong thing to do and we'll change that in a sec. Um, so instead of that we're going to move it by a certain amount. So the way we do that is we get hold of the current transform of this shape. So what, what a transform means is essentially where, what, it's, what is its position and its rotation. So we get hold of the current transform and then we we change the transform of the state by a particular amount that we want. Um, so I'm going to I'll make my um, editing window a bit bigger again so I can see. Um, and do that in the code I'm copying from. Uh, so we get hold of the transform and then we're going to set the transform of the actual state. So this is where we're actually moving the object. And set transform um, takes in a transform 2D and actually get transform returns a transform 2D. So T itself is a transform 2D. But we don't just want to set it back to T again because that won't change it. Instead, we want to make ourselves a new transform 2D, which is what we're doing here. Uh, and a transform is made out of a rotation and a position. So we don't want to change the rotation of this object. We're fine with it being rotated the same way it is now. So for the rotation, we just pass in the rotation of T, or as in what, what's the current uh, rotation of this transform. I'm just going to lay it out a bit differently so that um, if it's going to fit on the screen when the screen's not so big. Um, whoops, I'm not going to lay it out like that. Um, so I've done it completely wrong. Um, but yeah, the trans so transform 2D takes in how much how much rotated this object is, and it's going to be just the same amount as rotated as it was before, and also where is it. So where is it? Um, it's called the origin in the transformation. So we're gonna we're saying um, tell me the, the current position. That's what get origin is giving me, and then we're gonna add on uh, how much we want to move it by. Um, so we're gonna add on um, yeah, how much we want to move it by. So I'm gonna call that. We haven't got that yet, but I'm gonna call it translate by. So what we're saying is set the, the the transform of this object to be the rotation it already had, the position it already had, plus something else which we haven't done yet. 
And what we're going to do is, from the code we were looking at a minute ago, we're going to set this translate by to be something useful. So, in order, the way we do that is we we set it, we, we make it be a variable that sits um, outside here, so not inside this function, but as a, a property of this object all by itself. And then we're going to change this from the outside in the other bit of script that we wrote. Um, so, yeah, but we're only going to do all of this stuff if transform by is actually something useful. So in fact, instead of setting it to zero here, I'm going to set it to null. So null just means um, there's no there's no values. There's sort of a, a nothing value stored inside translate by. Um, if you're used to Python, in Python that's called none, but null works very similarly to that. And what we're going to say is if translate by colon, and then do all of this stuff. So what that checks is Basically, if translate by is still null, we won't get inside this if. So we won't do any of this cool stuff. But if someone from the outside makes a change to translate by, well then we'll do this stuff, we'll set the transform on this state, and that will actually affect the position of the object. And the, the way amount will move it is how much we told it to move. So it starts off kind of doing nothing because translate by is null, and it won't get inside the if. But if someone changes that from the outside, um, then it will do something. So let's have a look back at our other code in world.gd. So here's the code that we did something wrong in because we called translate. Instead of that, what we're going to do is we're going to, instead of calling a method called translate, we're going to set a variable value translate by, which is exactly the one we just made here, this one here. We're going to set it to be how much the person moves the mouse when they were dragging. Uh, and then that the shape will move by that much when we drag. So let's try that out and see whether we've got that going. So when I click and drag, it should move. It's not moving. Why not? I wonder. So let's check back on our code and figure out what we've done wrong. It could be it could be that it's because the shape is asleep. So I was hoping we wouldn't have to think about waking up for that shape um, yet. Um, yeah, let me explain that. So as I was saying, when uh, when um, the the go dot engine is doing physics for this object, it notices that it stopped moving, so it sends the object to sleep so you don't have to think about it. And that has been one of the big things that I've kind of worked around and why I thought it was worth making this video to explain how I got this working. So this shape has fallen asleep, and what that means is this code that we've written in Integrate Forces is not actually getting called because no physics calculations are happening for this object. So what we've done here is we've asked the shape to move um, but the actual movement will happen, happen inside the uh, integrate forces method, uh, which isn't getting called. So what we have to do is wake up that object. And the way we do that, at least for now, is we call set sleeping on the square and set it to full. So that basically means, um, no, you shouldn't be sleeping. You should do some physics. Um, and let's try again, see whether that was the only problem I had. Yeah, so now I can drag that object around. Oh gosh, it's bouncing everywhere. Um, but it drags and it keeps on doing physics as well. And let's try letting it fall asleep. So I didn't quite let it fall asleep then. Let's try letting it fall asleep and then we should see that when we drag it, it wakes up again. There we go. Now you'll notice it's kept on moving. Um, whoa, when I bounced off the edge. Um, and that's not because it's got momentum, it's, it's more movement than that. What's happening there is I left in a little bug. So if we have a look at shape, um, when we've set translate by to something interesting, then this if gets activated, we move the object. But the problem is the next time we calculate the object, translate, st it, translate by is still going to be something interesting. Um, so we're going to move it again. And that's not what we want to do. So let's set translate by back to null again. Once we've moved the object, 
we've we've used up this bit of movement that we were given. <clears throat> we don't need to um, do it again. So we can just set that to null, and then next time we won't even get inside the if. So let's try that out, see if that makes our world a bit better. Well, you may have noticed something else to happen then, so we'll have a look at that too. So that seems to be working. Now we've we can drag it around, and it doesn't um, it doesn't keep on moving in the same direction we dragged it next time. So we fixed that problem, but you will notice as we drag it around. It gets pulled downwards more and more strongly. Oh, it's actually clipped all the way through the floor because it was falling so fast. Um, so the gravity is still it's still increasing its speed even as we're trying to drag it around and move it somewhere. So we need to uh, need to deal with that problem as well. Um, otherwise, we're constantly fighting gravity while we're trying to drag. It's a nightmare. Um, so let's fix that. So essentially, what we want to do here is if we are dragging the object around, we should make sure that it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have any velocity other than the movement that we're giving it. So essentially, we want to stop it spinning and stop it moving um, while it's being dragged. So what we're going to do is actually the, the we've been keeping track of whether the object's being dragged outside in the other script in the world.td script, but actually. Let's keep track of it in here because we're going to need to use it in here. And when we've got more than one object, actually keeping track of it in here is the right, is the nice way to handle it anyway. So uh, just like we made a variable called translate by, we're going to make another variable called dragging. And we're going to be setting that from outside instead of tracking whether we're dragging the object um, in world itself, in world.gd itself. So keep hold of whether it's being dragged or not because if it's being dragged, it shouldn't have any velocity, so or any angular velocity. So what we can do is we can say state dot set. Oops, not set 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 linear velocity, and we're going to set it to a vector two. So remember, I mentioned vector twos earlier. So here's where we're using one. So again, because we're inside the integrate forces function, we're allowed to change this state. We couldn't change it by calling something like transform from the outside. But because this all happens inside the physics loop, we're allowed to do stuff. So what, we, what we're doing is changing state to set its linear velocity. Uh, and because it's a velocity, that means it's got an x and a y component. Um, and in this case, um, it, the x and y component, we both want to be zero, because we want to just have it not be moving. So we make a vector two, which represents that that lack of movement. So zero in the x direction, zero in the y direction, and we call set linear velocity passing that vector two in. And we're also going to set the angular velocity. By the way, I noticed that sometimes um, uh, the Go dot engine it isn't clever enough to to offer the right suggestion. So here it didn't give me the set linear velocity and the set angular velocity methods even though they're allowed. And the reason for that is it doesn't know, I guess, it doesn't know what type of... Actually, I don't know why in this case it doesn't know. But it doesn't seem to. So, and also, there's no point doing any of this um, movement stuff unless we're dragging. So let's just select all that and press tab so that all of this gets indented a bit more. So we only even look at whether translate by is set if we're actually dragging the object. I think that makes sense. Um, so at this point, just looking at my reference, the, the code that's going to go inside this shape.gd is actually finished. This is exactly what I've got in my, my reference. So what it, all it says is, um, we've got these variables, am I being dragged at the moment? Have I just been told to move by a certain amount? Um, and those get set from outside. Then if I'm being dragged, set my velocity and my angular velocity, as in how much I'm spinning, to zero. And then if I've actually been moved a bit, get hold of my transform and then set my transform to a slightly modified version of that where I've moved by the amount I've been told to move by. So that kind of makes sense for that's that's the co all the code that needs to live inside that square object and later also in the triangle object. So let's try that out, see if that's any better. What we should see now is that we can move square around seem to be able to move it at all. Oh, I tell you what, I haven't finished with my changes, so no wonder. Um, so what I missed out was I made this variable called dragging, which lives inside the square, but I'm not using it yet. I'm still using the variable that I made in here called dragging. So let's get rid of it from here. 
and let's get hold of the shape in a different place. So I'm going to use it in multiple places. So I need, I've got this square object from the tree, if you remember, and now it's the square object that has something inside it called dragging. I was, I was still using dragging inside this file, um, but actually for the code that I just wrote inside shape, we need the, that dragging variable to be stored inside shape. So now I'm using that one instead of um, the one that was locally at the top here. So now with any luck, this code will work. I can drag around the object and you'll notice that when I let go, it starts off falling, well in that case it doesn't start, so we'll fix that in a minute. Um, You'll notice the first time I did that, let's try that again. Um, it started off quite slow. Oh, yeah, you need to try and nudge it a bit and then it works. Um, it starts off slow instead of having picked up all that velocity and not lost it yet. Um, we've set it and actually if we even if we pick it up while it's spinning, if I can make it drop on here and be spinning. Oh, it's spinning very, very slowly anyway. Yeah, if I pick it up, it stops spinning as well. So uh, that setting the angular velocity to zero and setting the linear velocity to zero just means it's no longer moving. So we're getting somewhere. But you'll notice sometimes when I pick it up and I let go, it doesn't do anything. And that's because it's fallen asleep again. Uh, so let's try and wake it up. And we're going to do a couple of things. I had, to, I had to fight against this a little bit. So a couple of little tricks. So what I, what I decided was wherever I'm actually going to be moving a shape, that could actually affect any of the other um, shapes in the world. Not just the one that I dragged, but it could, I could have bumped into another one. So actually, any time I drag something around, I need to wake up all of the objects and make sure none of them are asleep. So actually, the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that I can get a list of all the shapes in my world, because at the moment, um, um, my square and my triangle um, are just uh, in in a big long list which contains the floor and could contain a whole load of other stuff as well. So I'm going to make myself a little folder. Actually, it's just going to be a node. So I just double click on node here. I'm going to call that shapes. So this is going to be um, just a convenient place for me to put all the all the things that are going to um, be affected by physics or the, that are, things that I want to wake up in this scenario is basically what I'm saying. So I potentially want to wake up the square and the triangle, so I'm going to drag the square and the triangle inside shapes. And now I'm going to use this name shapes to get hold of everything I might want to do. So I can go back to my script, go back to world.gd. And basically what I'm saying is every time I'm dragging something, I need to wake up all the shapes. So the way I'm going to do that. Is should I be in the if? Yes, I should. So um, th th this can only happen if I'm actually dragging the shape. Um, but yeah, I've decided I'm going to um, move it, so I'm going to wake up all the shapes. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to get hold of all the nodes. I'm calling get node again, but this time I'm not looking for square. I'm looking for shapes because that's what I called my folder. And for all the nodes that are inside that node, so I have to call get children. So this get node shapes gives me that new node I just made called shapes. But I'm saying give me all of the children, as in all the nodes that are inside there, and then I'm going to loop through them. So this says for the for node in means loop through every all of these children, and for each one that you find, put it inside node because I want to do something with it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do set sleeping to false. So um, that what that will do is wake up the node at least for long enough to uh, redraw it once. And you'll see later that's not quite good enough to make it always work. But it, we should see that it mostly works when I do this now. Something went wrong. Some kind of error. Getting printed out if I make my window smaller. Um, yeah, if I look at the debug window, I can see some kind of error happened. Oh, 
point fourteen. Um, so shape was null. So um, <clears throat> for some reason. We had some mouse movement. We tried to get hold of the square node. It came back null. I wonder why. I would have expected it always to get set here, but maybe this stuff actually happens before um, these nodes uh, exist yet. I, could, I guess that could well happen. So perhaps the whole scene hasn't been created, but we've already got a mouse movement event happening. So we have to deal with the situation that maybe that shape is null. And actually, that fits quite nicely with what I'm going to do later, because I'm going to uh, later on I'm going to figure out which shape you clicked on. If you didn't click on any shape at all, um, then I'm going to set shape to be null anyway. So let's just handle it immediately here. So the way we can check the shape is not null, we could just say and shape here, but I feel like it's clearer to say and shape is not null. So what we're saying is if we've got some mouse motion events and we've actually got a shape to deal with, um, then um, then do all this other logic. So let's try that again. And again, something went wrong. Um, possibly, yeah, because this line is also not working. So can we fix that? Well, for now, we can just say, for now, we just will do the same thing. And then later on, I'll, I'll change that. But for now, um, we just won't do it, either of these things if shape is null. And then it should mean that we can see our example working. Now I can't drag it around. Did I do it wrong? It seems like shape is always null. Uh, perhaps, perhaps, ah, uh, you know what, I know what it is. So perhaps I need to get rid of this thing because it's never going to be null. I think what it is is that um, but when I moved square to be inside the shapes node, you can't get hold of it by just saying square anymore. You have to say shape slash square. So soon we're going to get rid of this anyway because we don't want to hard code it to be the square but for now that's how we get hold of that object. Now hopefully I can drag it around. Yeah I can drag it around and you can see that it's less likely to get stuck but not always completely unlikely to get stuck. I had to unstick it there. So um, also if I bump into the triangle you can see it getting bumped around so um, that shows that the triangle is getting woken up as well. So we're kind of getting somewhere I love watching the physics um, resolve itself, especially when things fall off things like this. Um, so we're getting somewhere, but we've still got this problem that uh, the node that we've been moving around, we, if we stop moving and let go of it really carefully, it will get stuck. Um, so the way that I figured out to stop that from happening is actually I need to wake it up. I wake it up and wake up all the things... Um, all the things in the world, not just when there's been some mouse motion, because there might not have been any mouse motion recently, um, but also when I stop dragging. So here is the point where I stop dragging. So I'm going to get hold of this um, code and do the same thing again. I'm going to say get hold of all the things inside shapes and stop them from sleeping when I let go of the mouse button. And this whole chunk here, this is for when I let go of the mouse button. And then something else that I found I needed um, to just to make doubly sure that this the shape you're dragging never gets stuck is actually I needed to just give it a bit of a nudge um, because uh, it seemed it seemed like sometimes um, even though gravity was about to move the object it kind of fell asleep just before it um, gravity had a chance to do that um, so. Um, to get over that, what we can do is we can apply an impulse to to the shape at this very moment. And that is something that I'm pretty sure you're allowed to do um, 
here, not inside that, um, not inside the special integrate forces method, but just somewhere outside, um, is to say, okay, some kind of um, instantaneous force has been applied to this object. Um, please, please deal with that in your physics simulation. Uh, that I'm pretty sure is allowed. It seems to work. Um, so we're applying an impulse that basically means kind of give it a flick, hit it as if as if a, an instantaneous force was applied to it. That's why it's called an impulse, not a force. Um, and then these two, th the two arg arguments we passed in are a vector to say where on the object should that force be applied. I'm just saying zero zero, which means in the middle of it. And what force is going to be applied? And basically, this is another vector which says no sideways force and a little bit of downwards force. So we're actually just giving it a bit of a kick to say, please start falling under gravity. Um, and then with that stuff in place, it should not get stuck. And this was getting this stuff, realizing I needed this stuff, was one of the key things um, that I figured out that made me feel like I should make this video about how to drag and drop stuff when it's inside a physics-y world. So let's try it. So I can move it around. And even if I um, I'm very careful and try and just really leave it um, with no movement at all, um, it always gets that little kick, which means it starts falling. And it's all good. And we can do all that. Now we can start actually playing with these objects. If only we could move the triangle as well. So we've got the square moving pretty much how we want it. We can try and balance it on the point of this triangle here. And surprisingly, it's fair, it seems fairly easy to balance things, much more easy than it would be in the real world, which might be something I would need to fix if I was making a game based on this, or maybe it's just a fun thing. Um, yeah, so that means we can move the square, um, but just moving the square isn't fun enough. We need to be able to move the triangle as well. So we need to stop assuming that you've always clicked on the square. We need to start actually figuring out what you clicked on and whether you possibly clicked on nothing at all. So the way we do that is we um, uh, I, I, st I started trying, doing, trying to do this in code and I realized I'd made a little bit of a rule for myself which I was forgetting to follow. From the, watching people do videos on Godot it seems to me that wherever you have anything that might involve geometry or anything like that you should probably be thinking Oh, I shouldn't be doing this in the code editor. I should probably be doing this in the 2D view or in the 3D view. Uh, basically because geometry is hard. Um, so let's get Go Dot to do it for us. So, um, uh, in this case, what I'm gonna, what uh, the geometry that I want to do is, I, I know where you clicked your mouse and I want to know which shape you clicked on. So I started thinking, oh, can I loop through the shapes and ask? Like, is this coordinate inside you? Which is, that's doing geometry then at that point. Um, and I realized that that was probably the wrong approach. What we should do is use something in the real world. So what uh, the approach that I then moved on to, which I think is a much better idea, is um, when you click, I'm gonna make uh, a little object move to exactly where you clicked. And then I'm gonna ask, did that object collide with any of the shapes? And at that point, um, uh, it, that should work for figuring out, um, I mean it does work for figuring out which object you, uh, that little thing bumped into. Uh, that's gonna be an invisible thing. Um, and we're gonna make it now. So, click on world, we click the plus because we're making a new thing. And the type of thing we're gonna make is an area 2D. So you can see that's appeared and I'll call this the like mouse mouse collider or something like that and it's going to be invisible it's not going to have a polygon or anything that lets you see it um, like our other objects do which we actually see on the screen um, but it still needs to have uh, a collision shape um, it's just going to be completely invisible so we, we've got mouse collider selected and we can click plus and I'm going to choose a collision shape and I uh, although I said last time collision shapes were causing me problems uh, in this case, we want a circle, uh, and when I tried it, it seemed to work. So we're, we're going to make a collision shape, and we're going to choose here in the inspector at the top, what type of shape is it? Well, I want it to be a circle shape. And we're just going to zoom in on it a bit, because it's going to start off as quite a big circle, and we want it to be smaller than that. I'm going to turn off the uh, grid, and just make it a really small circle. So essentially... Um, when we click, we're going to move this shape to be where we clicked. 
And then we're going to say, did that shape crash into anything? Um, and if so, that thing we crashed into is going to be the thing we dragged. So, there's our shape. We called it Mouse Collider. What do I call it before? Before I called it Pointer. Just to make my life easier, I'm going to call it Pointer so that my code I'm writing this time looks the same as the code I'm copying from. So, um, we've made ourselves a little object so we can go back into our script world, have a look at the world script because that's where all the interesting stuff is happening. And basically, what happens is when our mouse goes down, we need to decide what object um, you clicked on, or maybe you didn't click on anything. And then all the other stuff that happens, like the mouse going up again, or the mouse moving, it's all going to be based on that same shape. So essentially, what I'm saying is, we're going to have a variable called shape, which is visible to all the code, and it's going to last a bit longer um, than we've got it currently, because currently we're making a variable called shape here. And it's going to start off as null because we haven't clicked on anything. And then when we click, we might possibly change this shape to be not null. So when when we do a, uh, a mouse down, that's the moment when we choose, our, was I on a shape at that time? So I'm actually going to write a separate function to find out what shape you clicked on. Um, because this function was getting a bit long. So I'm going to... I use a classic programming technique, which is pretending my function already exists, even though it doesn't. Um, so it's going to be called find colliding shape. This is the function we're about to write. So it basically says um, we're going to ask the event what was the position where you clicked. We know it's a clicked event because it, it's a mouse button event, and then um, we asked whether it's pressed, and the answer was yes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this code. So now we know it's a clicked event, so it's going to have a position saying where you clicked. And we want to find out what shape is at that position in the world. And that's going to be the shape we drag. And if you didn't um, find anything there, we're going to do nothing. So basically, um, did we click on what, click, what shape did we click on? Oh, if we clicked on no shape, well, just return. There's nothing for us to do. Um, it was a, there was a click, but it wasn't on a shape, so don't change what shape is. Shape's just null, null um, and just return straight out of there. But if we did um, find a shape that we clicked on, um, then just set, change that shape to say, oh, the, the, you are being dragged. And also, we've already changed this variable to say which shape is being dragged. So the world script has this here saying, oh, I know which shape is being dragged. Whereas the shape itself knows, am I being dragged? Yes, because we changed that. So all this has just reminded me that um, in order for this to work, the triangle needs to have the same code as the square. Remember I said that earlier? So um, we, if we look at the square, we can see if we scroll right to the bottom of the inspector, it says script shape.gd. If I look at triangle, I scroll all the way to the bottom of the inspector, it says script null. So currently triangle has got no code associated with it, but we can actually associate the same piece of code with both by clicking on that and saying load and then choosing shape.gd. So now both the square and the triangle have the same code underneath them. And what that means is that the triangle also now has something called dragging inside it. So when we when we find out that we've collided with the triangle by, by calling this function that we're about to write, um, if it returns back the triangle, we can then we're then okay to say shape dot dragging equals true because the triangle does have a dragging inside it because the triangle is using this code, um, and that dragging is is um, different from the, the ver version of dragging in the other shape. I'm fairly sure, although I'm starting to doubt myself. Okay, so let's review a little bit what we've got and the logic that we've got, and while we review it, I will check back with what. Um, what I wrote last time I did this and check that um, it, it still fits. So um, we have two possible types of event. Either it was a mouse button event or it was a mouse motion event. If it was a mouse button event, there's two possibilities inside there, which is either it was a mouse down or a mouse up. If it was a mouse down, we go and find out whether you clicked on a shape. If you didn't click on a shape, we give up. If you did click on a shape, tell that shape it's being dragged. Um, and then similarly, um, I've just spotted a bug, so that was, this was worth this review was worth doing. 
Um, if there was an, a mouse up event, we get into this else part. And we want to tell the shape that we're dragging, um, you're not being dragged anymore. So we set dragging to false. However, if we're not actually dragging a shape, that's going to go wrong because shape is going to be null. So let's just change this to if shape is not null. So if we get a mouse up, but shape is null, we, there's, we're not really interested. We don't care. We could just not do anything. Um, but if, shape, if the shape's not null, that means we were dragging something. So we need to tell that shape, you're not being dragged anymore. Uh, and we need to um, wake it up, give it a bit of a kick. We need to make all the shapes know they're not asleep. Well, they shouldn't be asleep, just in case some of that dragging that we did caused some movement um, or some, some stuff that they need to think about in their physics. Maybe we removed something from underneath them so they need to fall down. And then the other thing we need to do is we need to make sure we're setting back, setting our shape variable back to null to say, yeah, you're no longer dragging a shape. And then the rest of this logic will work. And then, let's move me up here for a sec. So, and then the next bit of code is if the mouse moved and um, we're actually dragging a shape at the moment. So this and shape not equal to null now means, oh, well, is, uh, is there a shape that we're dragging? Um, if we're not dragging anything, well, then we do nothing with mouse motion events. We just ignore them. But um, if shape's not null, then we can do this bit of code. Now, actually, this um, this bit of code, uh, this if is no longer helpful to us because if the shape um, is not null, well, then it is definitely being dragged. So we can get rid of this bit because we because we set it to null here. We know that it's being dragged. We can just stop asking that question because we always know it's being dragged. So I just did a shift tab there, by the way. So shift tab unindents everything and then tab indents everything. That could be useful to you. Um, so we can get rid of that. We'll check whether it's being dragged. We know it's being dragged. And what we want to do is we want to set say how much you're going to move it by based on the movement um, that was stored inside this motion event that we got. And then also we need to wake it up. Um, and actually we don't need this line anymore because we're actually setting all the nodes to be not sleeping so we can get rid of that line. So we're just saying, okay, move, shape, move yourself by this much next time you get a chance in your physics simulation. Um, and then also just wake up all the nodes so they can notice that something's dropped out from underneath them or something like that. Um, and that's all we need for now. So let's try this out again and I will see if I can show you why we need a slight uh, variation before we get on to actually choosing which shape got collided with. Oh, actually, no, if I want to show you this, I've got to... So I you remember I told you that uh, a nice little trick we often do in programming is pretending we've written a function. That doesn't work if you never actually write that function, so we better do that. So find colliding shape. Uh, we passed in the position where you... essentially where you clicked. Um, and say, uh, So we're just saying, you know, tell me which shape you clicked on. Uh, and actually, I'm going to cheat for a second, and I'm going to just do the thing we were doing before, because I want to show you how this is working so far. So I'm going to pretend that you always clicked on the square. So we should get the same behavior we had um, uh, earlier in the video. Um, later, uh, soon, we're going to implement this method properly. So now let's try it out. And we're still just always dragging the square because we haven't done that bit yet. But what I wanted to show you was sometimes that square might lag behind a bit. If I move quickly, you can see the shape's no longer under my pointer. It was under my pointer when I started. I can kind of lose it. And I think the reason for that is that we might get multiple mouse motion events um, and actually only one physics event or only one round of physics processing is happening. Uh, so what we need to do is collect all the mouse motion events that have happened since the last time we did some physics, uh, add them all up, and then use all of them um, uh, to be how much we translate the shape by. So what that works uh, out essentially as is, here we're just setting translate by to the kind of latest bit of movement that happened. But there might be some movement that's already... Um, uh, that's already been noticed but hasn't actually been processed in the physics processing and if that happens we want to just add on this new bit of movement that, that happened with the mouse so that both those things get included when we actually do some physics so that works out as pretty simply it's just if um, if we haven't if we've got if we haven't already got any movement then kind of set the movement that we've 
already got to no movement. I'll explain this in a sec because it's slightly, the way I've done it is slightly weird, but it, um, it was kind of neat. Um, yeah, I think that's right. So um, let's try that. Oh, hang on, I've got, I need equals equals there. So if you're checking whether something is equal to something else, you use equals equals, just like in lots of languages, including Python. Um, I missed out one the equals. So what we're saying is, if um, if this translate by is null, set it to zero, as in no movement. Uh, and uh, and if it wasn't, if it's already set to something, we do nothing from these two lines. And that means once we've set it to zero, we can then add stuff to it. That's all the reason. The reason I set it to zero is because I'm about to add something to it. Um, so add on the um, the motion that we've just received from this event um, to the motion that was already there. And with any luck, it won't lag behind now. Oh, it works. So now it's following my pointer, even if I move it around quite quickly. Um, and I've just noticed that my example project doesn't doesn't have that fixed in it. <laughs> but anyway, I've uh, just corrected it now. So um, now everything about this is working the way we want it to. And most of the hard stuff that I've figured out about doing this apply impulse and stopping things from being asleep and noticing these extra um, events is done. The only thing we need to do is notice which um, which object you actually clicked on. So let me remind you, we made, in our world, we made this new object, uh, I'm in the way again, um, this new object called pointer and this pointer has a collision shape, which is just a small circle. And we're going to use this pointer object to figure out what you clicked on. Um, so we've already got a function defined, which is supposed to tell us what you clicked on, but at the moment it just always says square. So we'll get rid of this line and we'll do it properly. So first of all, we're going to get hold of that pointer object. Again, using get node. And basically the plan is set this pointer to where we clicked and then ask what it's colliding with. So first of all, we move it. Now notice we are allowed to use things like set position or um, translate on this object because this object is not affected by physics. This object is an area 2D, not a rigid body 2D or something like that. Um, so that's absolutely fine for us to set its position. It's not, there's no one else competing with us to set its position to something um, because of gravity or collision or something like that. So it's fine to set its position. So we set its position to where you clicked. You remember when we when we got our click event, we called find colliding shape and we passed in the, the place where you clicked on the screen from by calling by using the position property of the event. So that comes through here as this pause argument. And we use that to say, okay, get hold of pointer, which was this thing with a little circle that's invisible. Remember, it's invisible. Uh, set its position to pause, and now we're going to ask what it's colliding with. So what we're going to do is, again, we're going to loop through all the nodes inside that shapes node, basically saying, do this for every shape. And then for each shape, we're going to ask, are you colliding with pointer right now? And the way we do that, um, rather than normally when there are collisions, you would get some kind of collision event happening and you would um, listen to those events. Um, but here we're doing it in a bit of a more manual way, looping through all the shapes and saying, um, if I manually uh, collide your shape with this shape, is there a collision? Um, I didn't think using an event here would be a good idea because we kind of come out of this code and then come back in again uh, for the event processing and who knows how much later that would happen or something like that. So. I don't know whether that's right, but that, that's what I went with, and this seems to work. So again, right, let's give me a comment if I've not done it the best way. So first of all, we're going to get hold of the shape of this node. So we've gone through all the nodes, um, but each of those nodes has a, a collision shape inside it. Um, you remember, it, for the square, it's a square, for the triangle, it's a triangle, and for pointer, it's just a little circle. Um, although the, we're looping through all the nodes in shapes, so we won't get pointer here. We'll only get the circle in the triangle. So I've type shade, but I mean shape. Um, shape owner get shape okay, zero comma zero. So what that means, as far as I understand it, is give me your collision shape, uh, which is the the square or the triangle collision shape two D that's inside 
that object. So give me your shape and then um, tell me, are you colliding with the shape of the pointer? So actually, let's get hold of the pointer's shape here. So pointer's shape is going to be the same thing again, so, but this time for the pointer. So pointer dot shape owner get shape zero comma zero. Just check that. Yeah. And also we're going to get hold of where that pointer is. And the way we do that is pointer transform. So this is all kind of under the hood stuff, as far as I understand it. This is the kind of stuff that um, that that Go dot does when it's. Hang on, what have I done? <laughs> That's not right. Um, translation. No, transform. That's fine. Um, That's me trying to talk and type at the same time. So. Um, Spelled transform wrong as well. Um, this is the kind of stuff that the Go dot does under the hood when it's trying to figure out whether things are colliding. Normally, we don't have to bother actually thinking about it ourselves, but in this case, we have to get hold of this collision shape and the transform. Spelled transform wrong there as well. Um, and all of this is leading up to this line here, which is shape dot collide. It's node dot get transform. And then the pointer shape and the pointer transform. So all of this says, tell me shape. This shape, which is the shape of the node. If I if I transform you by the this normal transformation that you're being transformed, I like in the position where you where node is, do you collide with the the shape of pointer if pointer is where pointer is? So you can see why we don't normally bother with all this stuff because that's exactly what Godot is doing for us. Um, but in this case, we have to um, um, uh, we have to do it manually because we do. We're kind of looping through and asking about this collision rather than letting it happen by some kind of event. And then res is just going to be yes or no. Did we did we collide or did we not? So all we're going to ask is. Um, if the result was true, as in uh, if it does collide, well, that means that node is is the shape that we clicked on. And otherwise, um, we didn't click on it. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, not otherwise. Otherwise, we're going to move on to the next shape. So either um, this shape, we did collide with the, the, the shape, so that means we did click on this node, so we should return this node, or... We loop through all of the nodes inside shapes. None of them is the right one. We didn't click on any one. In that case, we return null. And whenever you return null, you need to think about, well, um, what will happen to the people calling me um, if I return null? But we've already dealt with that idea. So if find colliding shape returns null, well, then we, we're already expecting that to happen. So that's fine. So now, with any luck, all that faffing about should mean when we click on an object, instead of just always thinking we clicked on square, we'll move the actual thing that we clicked on. So let's run the game. Try moving the square, try moving the triangle. And finally, we can drop the triangle on top of the square instead of dropping the square on top of the triangle. And it correctly detects which objects we're clicking on. You can drag them around and they happily do physics as well as being dragged and dropped. Um, so hopefully that made a bit of sense to you. Um, hopefully this is um, not just a useful introduction to how to make drag and drop work when there's physics on, but also some more of the general ideas of how scripts and things like that in Go dot work. Also, I'm hoping it will move us on in a series where we create a game together um, which uses this stuff. So um, possibly a game where you have to build some kind of structure by dragging blocks around like this maybe uh, to, to be high enough or to cover up, you know, get to a certain goal, or, or possibly a game where you blow up things, because watching physics simulations where you've exploded a whole load of stuff is really fun. Um, so maybe this dragging and dropping is how you design levels for a game where actually you just blow up blocks and watch them fly all over the screen. Uh, uh, let me know um, uh, what things I assumed you knew that you didn't know let me know what type of game you'd like us to work on 
Uh, let me know what things about Godot are really frustrating you and you can't figure out. Maybe I can get somewhere and help you with it. And see you next time.